With more on China's economy for the next year, we're joined by William Lee. He's chief economist with the Milken Institute. Uh, always great to see you. Thanks for having me, Elaine. Well, let's start with this uh, big gathering, economic gathering in Beijing, uh, and this one quote that came out of it, overall economy is resilient and has great potential. Want to get your thoughts on that and the current state of China's economy with the next following months to come, the first half of 2023. I think nothing uh, could be said that is more true about China. Phenomenal potential, which is why so much foreign capital has flowed into China. And the workers there are the, one of the most efficient set of workers in the world. And so that combination will give China a lot of potential for growing at a fairly rapid clip going into the future. The trick is, how do we get past this post-COVID environment? Most countries that have opened up after COVID uh, have had difficulties adjusting. A lot of disruptions come about because a lot of sick workers, and a lot of disruptions still remain. And being able to smooth that over with the appropriate settings for monetary fiscal policy are going to be critical. And for the next two or three months, the, the, the balance between the outbreak in cases and the resumption of consumption and business activity, that balance is the thing that's going to have to be struck very carefully. And don't you think that's what people are really looking to see, what happens, um, the impact of China's COVID easing? We've seen these changes uh, very rapidly. How will that compare to how other countries' economies came out of COVID restrictions? Will people want to be out and about uh, like other people did in other countries? Uh, I mean, how do you look at this comparison? Well, let me take my country, the United States, for example. As soon as COVID restrictions were lifted, um, there was a burst of spending, a burst of consumption. People said, I just have to get out and see people again. Um, and China, for example, we'll be coming up to the Chinese New Year's. That's a time when people go home to their families and travel all over the country and travel even abroad if they could. And those are the kind of activities we want to encourage, but it'll be stifled by outbreaks of COVID that will naturally come about as people start to mingle. And so I think one of the, the things that we have to learn from experiences in other countries, not just the United States, but in Korea and, and other parts of Asia, is that there's going to be a dip and a disruption in activities. And the trick and challenge for all the managers uh, in all the businesses and governments will be how to manage the workforce to be able to function and operate with a lot of sick people, a lot of sick workers. And will people want to spend money? I mean, is there a lot of pent-up demand that we will see just burst forth? In most countries, we have a, an enormous amount of savings that people just said, my God, I've got this much money that I and haven't been on vacation. I'm going to be spending a lot of money. China, I think, might be different because China has naturally had a very high savings rate. Uh, but right now, because of disruptions in the property market, a lot of people are afraid that, well, my wealth really isn't there anymore or it's not safe, which is why President Xi Jinping has always said we need to have a stable environment. He's put a lot of priority to fixing the real estate sector, and that's going to be absolutely critical to assure consumers that their wealth is safe, they can spend the savings because their wealth is going to be there when they need it. Uh, a lot of proposals coming out of this Central Economic Work Conference. Uh, do you think they'll work? How long will they take to work? How long before we see everything trickle down to local businesses, the average person? Um, I guess that's what everyone wants to know. How long will this all take to work itself through? I think the, the, the strategy that's being put in place, which is to use monetary and fiscal policy to support the environment, to give stability, and to allow private activity to take place, is exactly the right strategy. I think that the unfolding is going to have to happen in a way that, well, we know that monetary fiscal policy is being constrained because the, the, the huge amount of debt in the, in the municipal government sector limits how much they can do. Most of their revenues come from land sales, and there's not a lot of land sales going on. Uh, on, on the monetary policy side, the um, ability for the central bank to keep interest rates low is also limited because global interest rates are going up because all central banks around the world are trying to fight inflation. So, so the, the government authorities and policymakers are facing some enormous challenges uh, that make their difficult their tasks even more difficult than usual in, a, in an economy that's opening up from COVID. And, and that being said, William, what would China's economic recovery mean for the global economy? What sort of ripple effects could we see from that? Once China gets back into gear and Chinese tourists start to go to Thailand and Korea and, and all the rest of Asia, there'll be an enormous amount of boom in these countries, which is exactly what they need because the Chinese tourists have been missing. 
Chinese imports have also been highly desired. Now, one, one, one caveat, though, as soon as China starts to, to, to grow fast again, there's going to be huge demand for commodities. Commodity prices are already high, and that might add to the inflation problems faced by the rest of the world. So there's going to be a balance between the two. A lot of other countries will have to take policies to counteract a lot of the upshift in inflation. But I think a lot of the GDP boom that comes about from Chinese spending will be a benefit to many, many countries.